ahead and get started. Well, thanks we'll for uh, getting their bagel sort of finish up, and I'll give an introduction to Professor Hennig. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Curry uh, Research Lecture. Thanks for coming to everyone. As you know, this series is sponsored by the Virginia Education Sciences Training or VEST Predoctoral Fellowship Program. It's supported by the Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education. I'm really pleased to welcome Jeffrey Henning today. He's a professor of political science and education at Teachers College and a professor of political science at Columbia University. He's the author or co-author of 10 books, including The Color of School Reform, Race, Politics, and the Challenge of Urban Education, and Building Civic Capacity, the Politics of Reforming Urban Schools, both of which were named in 1999 and 2001, respectively, as the best book on urban politics by the Urban Politics section of the American Political Science Association. Spin Cycle, which I brought my copy of today, um, how research gets used in policy debates, the case of charter schools focuses on the controversy surrounding the charter school study by the American Federation of Teachers and its implication for understanding politics, politicization, and the use of research to inform public discourse. It won the AERA Outstanding Book Award in 2010. Jeff has a more recent book, The End of Exceptionalism in American Education, that was published by Harvard Education Press in 2013. And so Jeff's going to talk today on Spin Cycle, um, and I think maybe update that a little bit, uh, some things that have occurred since. Um, but I think it's a great book. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, I'd encourage you to. I'm going to let Jeff set the ground rules, but we have roughly about an hour, hour and 15 minutes for Jeff's talk. So please welcome Jeff Lehman. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with being interrupted with questions, particularly if they're clarifying questions along the way. Otherwise, I'll keep pushing through so that there's more time for open questions at the end. So let me start with a contrite admission. I'm a political scientist by training. And despite years of effort at self-improvement, I still tend to think like one. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is about the politics of education research. But since political scientists do tend to think about these issues, come at them from a different angle than uh, many pr practitioners of education research, I thought I'd start by saying something about that. Um, particularly over the last 15 years, education policy research, as uh, you no doubt know, has doubled down on the importance of methodological rigor uh, with particular <coughs> attention to sharply defined research questions, objective evidence, improved data systems, and care and sophistication around causal inference. Often this emphasis is posed in opposition to politics, which is seen as a competing force and a corrupting force. Uh, where research is oriented towards the effective pursuit of the public good. Um, politics is seen as grounded in narrow partisan and organizational self-interest, where research seeks truth, uh, politics seeks advantage. Um, and one understandable and, uh, in a large part, justified result of this perception of things is a tendency to try to create buffers that protect research and the research enterprise from politics. Um, political scientists, though, tend to assume that politics is endemic. They assume that individuals and groups have largely competing interests, uh, that gains for one set of actors typically come at the expense of others, and that abstract claims about truth and evidence and the public good more often than not mask narrower aims, even when those making the claims may be sincere. Now, this doesn't mean that political scientists are hopelessly cynical, although sometimes I think they are. Um, uh, many believe that culture, knowledge, and well-designed institutions can encourage more cooperation, do a better job at finding fair negotiated settlements, 
introduce strong evidence into decision making. But at the same time, they and I find myself still uh, keep their cynical glasses at hand. So I, I offer that as uh, a sort of an, uh, a baseline, um, uh, uh, not to make the case that education research is wrong to be wary of politics, and I'll say more about this, but as a prelude to two points that we maybe can talk about uh, also if afterwards, which is it's better to understand politics than just try to bar the door. And secondly, that it may be important to distinguish between, I think it is important to distinguish between bad politics and good politics. And I think there's good politics that's supportive of, of, of research and knowledge, um, or at least can be. So I'm going to address these like big questions vis-a-vis -vis, um, the issue of charter school research. And then at the end, and especially if there's time, very self-consciously expand it a little bit uh, beyond that to talk generally about some of the politics around uh, issues relating to uses of data uh, in, in, in teachers and accountability systems and some of the other issues in which it emerge, emerges as well. So if you're not interested in charter schools, um, hang on. <laughs> so, um, so let's look at the case. So, um, Where, where do I got to point this? Work the second ago. Or maybe I'm going the wrong way. There we go. All right. Thank you. So I think you all uh, know the, the basics about charter schools. The first one opened in, uh, uh, first one was. Uh, Actually, I don't think that's accurate. I think the legislation was passed in 1991 and Minnesota first went open the next year. And what's key about charter schools, and they vary uh, um, as is the case with so much in terms of education um, from state to state and place to place, um, uh, but the char charter in general are a mix, are meant to be a mix, have a mix of public and private attributes. They're public in some important senses Every, they're open to everyone. In almost every state, they're required to um, rely on a uh, lottery for admission if they're oversubscribed. They can't impose their own uh, admissions uh, requirements distinct from that. They're publicly funded, at least in large measure, publicly <laughs> funded. Um, they're private, though, in some other <coughs> senses that's important to their origin and to the basis of their support. They have their own boards, typically. They're um, meant to be uh, um, free from many of the public regulations uh, that apply to the traditional public schools in the state. And the money, importantly, follows, follows the students. If students leave uh, the public money, travels uh, with them. Many of them are private um, in other ways, too. Some of them are run by uh, even for-profit companies or part of larger uh, Nonprofit uh, um, networks, charter management organizations, um, uh, but you know the the intent at least is is that charter schools would combine the best of public and private, uh, the the equity and access issues protected by the public sector, and the um, competitive and um, uh, responsiveness issues and and innovation tied in many people's minds to the private sector. So the charter schools, because they have to keep their students uh, and their parents happy in order to hold on to the revenue that uh, follows them will be more in principle responsive to their needs, um, will be more innovative in thinking about market niches, what people want, more um, aggressive in looking ahead to imagine what people want. So there's a you know a fair number of you know this is an an an, uh, an innovation. People talk about education as resistant to change, uh, particularly in the U.S. But but charters really expanded quite uh, rapidly um, to the point where there's now um, roughly 6,400 schools. This. Uh, slide just shows the increase in the uh, 
total number of schools from 1999 until 2013. So you, you, know, you can see uh, a pretty substantial increase, and I don't have it here, but if we did this by number of students in charter schools, it would be even higher, because many of the schools, especially in the earlier stages, were um, small, a lot opened as you know, just a single grade and grew over time. In the early years of the charter movement, there were not, uh, for the most part, charters were standalone, often mom and pop kind of operations started by a community-based group or some former teachers or a, um, a, 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 a local nonprofit organization, and, and increasingly, um, uh, this has become the, the game of larger charter networks that are self-consciously trying to go to scale, and, and that means larger schools, uh, um, among other things. So, you know, very quickly, um, you know, the, the, the number of charter schools varies substantially by state, as shown in, in, in this uh, figure. The most charter schools are in California. There's over 1,000 uh, there, followed by Florida and Arizona. This is this figure showing um, a number of schools. This is showing a percentage of, of uh, students who go to charter schools, uh, percentage of public school students going to charter schools. So you can see you know, a little bit of difference. Arizona's high in both, but it especially stands out in terms of uh, the percentage uh, where about 25% of Arizona uh, public school students are in, in charter schools now followed by uh, Florida and California. And surprisingly to me, at least, the, uh, uh, Wisconsin jumps out here in terms of the per, per, uh, percentage of students. I'll leave it to you, you know, to, to sort of play the little game here of looking and saying, OK, what's the pattern? Okay, what, what, what determines where charter schools have located? But it's kind of tough. Um, it, you know, the obvious story is, and, it, and if we looked at sort of blue states versus red states, you know, expecting an ide a clear ideological difference or partisan difference that, you know, under the presumption that pri the charters are uh, a version of market-based uh, solutions and would be more popular in conservative sites, I think you'd have a hard time making that story stick. You know, the clearest thing is that the middle of the country doesn't have a lot of charter schools. People have looked at this systematically have also had a hard time kind of coming up with a clearly defined pattern. It's, it seems to be, uh, you know, that um, uh, factors like the, um, the partisan control of the governor's office plays a little bit of role that have to be sufficiently high per student allocations to make it attractive and economically viable for charter schools to operate in some places. And that accounts for some of the non-intuitive elements of the pattern, which is the places that have higher per pupil spending tend to be more the democratic um, um, and wealthier uh, states. Um, uh, some of this may have to do with philanthropic steering, uh, Walton family, Foundation, which has provided a lot of the startup money for the charter schools, has identified particular places it gives geographically. So there's a number of things that, that go into the story. But what, what's most important is, is that this isn't a big issue in a lot of places. You know, Virginia, you, you can find Virginia there, I know. So, you know, this isn't a big issue in Virginia for, um, uh, for yeah, at this point compared to. Um, uh, what it is in other places. And it's, this is much more uh, apparent when you go down to the district level. So this, is, uh, this figure shows uh, the market share, the 10 districts with the largest uh, uh, market share. Actually, it's more than 10. Um, um, I don't claim to be the world's best quantitative analyst, but I, I could have counted better than, uh, uh, than this in, in, in labeling the figure. Um, but you, you know, the, you know the, 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 the leader is, is New Orleans. People now some are saying that New Orleans is 100% charter. It's not quite 100% charter. There's a few uh, um, uh, 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 schools now still run by the local district. But it's closer now this year to, to over 90% charter, certainly. 
uh, followed by Detroit, which, you know, if you're into sort of horse race stories and things like that, Detroit, you know, galloped past uh, uh, DC recently, but over 50% of students in charter schools there, DC, District of Columbia, around 43%. Uh, percent. But, um, you know, but the big story is, uh, and this is relatively recent, for a long time people were saying, you know, what's the impact of charter schools on traditional districts? And the answer was, well, there aren't enough of them to really know. Um, but we now have a number of districts that within the last several years have, have got, <coughs> you know, a very substantial charter school uh, 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 population. Now, uh, my book, and to the lesser, a lesser extent, the article that at least some of you were forced to read, um, uh, plays out the particular case of the, as Jim said, of the uh, study in 2004 by the American Federation of Teachers of Charter Schools. The AFT, as you know, is the second largest teachers union. Um, on August, 17th of 2004, uh, this article sort of uh, burst pretty dramatically on the public scene uh, uh, when, when it was featured in an article in the New York Times. I quote in, in, in the book and in the article, uh, Mike Petrilli uh, from the Fordham Foundation, uh, you know, as saying that uh, August 17th, 2004 was a, quote, a day that will live in infamy for <laughs> charter proponents. Now, this is a lesson of sort of the hyperbole that comes around uh, debates and the tendency to magnify what's happening at the time that affects us all. I'm not blaming uh, Petrilli because the truth of the matter is if you go around and talk to people now, you know, and say, what happened on August 17th, 2004, I guarantee you, he might not even remember. Um, so th 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 these things changed. But nonetheless, it, it, it created quite a stir. Uh, and, and it's partly because the Times hadn't covered charter schools very extensively before this. Um, uh, you can see the placement of the article in journalist terms, print journalist terms, above the fold is the, is the expensive, uh, valuable real estate for journalists where, the, where they, uh, which, you know, is, is is a representation of how important the story is seen to be. And the head headline was Charter Schools Trail in Results US Data Reveals. And as those pullout quotes show, you know, the, those are the first two sentences in the article, but it emphasized first national test uh, showing uh, charter school students often doing worse than comparable students. Uh, and then with a, you know, a little bit of, a, of, of an edge vis-a-vis -vis the, the the um, politics of the time, uh, this is the White House under uh, George Bush, the findings buried in mountains of data uh, released without public announcement. Now some of this was the AFT's spin on the story. Uh, this was publicly available data. They had to work a little bit to find it. Um, uh, you know, dealt a blow to supporters of the charter school movement, including the Bush administration. And despite the summer doldrums, again quoting Petrilli, all hell broke loose. It's almost like I could sell the screenplay for a movie. Right? <laughs> a day that will live in infamy. Um, so, you know, so that, but, but there was an immediate response and, you know, and, and significantly, uh, I, I don't mean to be facetious about these things, uh, significantly, there was a, a, a response uh, from the charter school com community. Um, so within days, uh, Jeannie Allen, who was the head at the time for, of the Center for Education Reform, uh, uh, a, um, a pro-market, pro-choice, had been pro-voucher um, uh, um, uh, think tank slash advocacy organization in DC had mobilized the money and, um, and support of researchers and ran this full page ad in the Times. I think it also ran in the Wall Street Journal and maybe a couple of other places, uh, not inexpensive. Uh, and I, I know the print is, is small, um, 
uh, but you, you can see you know, that, that this was not your typical ad. This wasn't just a, 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 you know, an ad saying, oh no, charter schools are good, look at all the people who signed this. This was an ad that reads pretty much like a primer on, on proper social science methodology. Um, so it says, we, the undersigned members of the research community, are dismayed uh, by the prominent coverage. Um, and then those bullet points are a series of methodological critiques. So in your data management course, you know, you, would, you could do this too. You know, they point out, you know, this is just a, this wasn't longitudinal data, it was a snapshot on time. The controls for student background were very uh, minimal. Um, uh, uh, that, you know, the NAEP was not the appropriate uh, uh, test to be using judgment, to be making judgments like this, um, and, um, and that um, journalists have a responsibility for being uh, more critical in their uh, uh, response to research, particularly research coming from uh, 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 an interest group, a defined interest group with a stake uh, and the issue, and it was signed by a range of people, some of whom, if you follow charter school, school choice debates, you wouldn't be surprised uh, by. Um, so Terry Moe signed this, Jay Green, uh, uh, Carolyn Hoxby, Paul Peterson, prominent um, uh, social scientists uh, who have been identified with the pro-voucher and pro-choice side, but others were not so. Um, obvious, uh, um, Jim Sepulka, David Biglio, uh, James Heckman, University of Chicago. So, um, uh, you know, it was a, a, a claim that, that, you know, that research, you know, had a clear voice on, on, on this issue. And at the same time, choice proponents got busy um, placing editorials, you know, providing supporters with talking points for discussion on TV shows and the like, issuing critiques on uh, various newsletters and blogs, and uh, significantly also, in terms of my story, publicizing a counter report, okay, a report uh, by Carolyn Hoxby, uh, uh, which, um, which they claimed uh, was much stronger methodologically um, and which they said arrived at the opposite conclusion that charter schools um, were working very well indeed when compared systematically to uh, schools in the districts in which they were operating. Um, now, maybe not surprisingly, it wasn't long before these rebuttals themselves were um, uh, being you know, subject to intense scrutiny and the charges that the critics of the AFT report were hypocritical um, and selectively using these standards of social science to mask and advance an agenda that was grounded more in ideology than evidence. Um, some of the folks who had signed this had published results that also used data that wasn't longitudinal or that had limited uh, controls in terms of of the background factors of students, the argument was made. What's more, the Hoxby report, which appeared to have been rushed out in part, uh, this you know, wasn't a study that had undergone peer review and was published in a journal, um, uh, was found to contain some errors, uh, some in, in, for some cities fairly major, in DC it was fairly uh, um, major that they there were two chartering bodies in, in D.C. at the time, and, and her study had included the schools chartered by one of these authorizing agencies, but not the others. It would have made a difference, probably not in the overall uh, findings. But, um, but the, you know, the, the, the point is that this was an argument that was being fought out on terms of good social science versus bad social science, at least um, on, on the face of it. And, and that crystallized, for me, uh, something of a paradox around the public use of research in some of today's high profile education policy debates. On the one hand, research and the details of methodology were at center stage. This is unusual. Um, you know, and this was, you know, fitting with the time and No Child Left Behind legislation makes something like 200 references to scientifically based evidence and the importance of scientifically based evidence. Uh, 
But on the other hand, it was swiftly transformed into political jockeying and the kind of finger pointing that I think feeds cynicism. Um, now, sniping among researchers and interest groups about research isn't anything new or specific to education. Medical researchers clash over things like the health risks of salt or fat in the diet. Climatologists, as you all know, tussle about the extent, causes, or even, in some instances, the existence of global warming. And in these instances, two competing interest groups call on their own stock of favored studies and favored researchers, while claims about what constitutes good research seem to be tactically manipulated in order to discredit those on the opposite side. But arguably, in the area of school choice research, including vouchers as well as cha charters, this has been particularly, the rhetoric's been particularly high-pitched and often uh, partisan, polarized, and, and, and personalized. Just to give you a taste of this, this is, you know, these are quotes from, uh, from researchers um, uh, uh, about um, uh, one another. Okay. Uh, one researcher characterizes, published characterizing uh, another study as bad science. Another one complaining about critiques of their work as part of a campaign to pillory, marginalize, and suppress their findings. Words like chicanery. And this last one, one of my favorites from, it was as, as part of the research uh, for my book, I interviewed a lot of researchers. Uh, 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 various kinds on, on, on some of these issues and, uh, well, you can read it yourself. If someone brings a knife to the fight, you better bring a knife to the fight too. The, the point being there too, of course, a reference to how this escalates and, you know, and, and in this person's uh, estimation, against one's will, one has to join in, right? Otherwise, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what metaphorical knives in, uh, in social science debates actually turn into. I don't think blood on the floor, but. Um, and, you know, this, this, you know, also affected how these issues were portrayed in the media. So, um, uh, I, I wanna just briefly reference two cases, which, again, both of these are cases where it's pretty unusual. I, I do wanna emphasize, maybe this will be reassuring to some of you, which is most research that most of you do will never be talked about uh, <laughs> um, outside your tenure committee. Um, but, um, but every once in a while, it, 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 it does uh, come to public attention. The, in, in both of these instances, these were uh, uh, debates that got made it to the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the first one uh, in uh, 1996 focused on uh, research on Milwaukee's voucher system, Milwaukee being the first uh, um, urban voucher system in, the, uh, in a major city in the U.S. And, uh, and as the uh, journalist who wrote the article said, th this pitted Paul Peterson, political scientist at Harvard, against John Witte, a political scientist at University of Wisconsin. John Witte had been the, more or less the official uh, he had access to the Wisconsin data and was issuing the early uh, reports on, on outcomes, um, which, um, which is important to say, I think, were kind of um, uh, modest and nuanced claims about what was going on. Witte was pretty careful in terms of not over-presenting, but they, what they didn't show clearly was big jumps in voucher schools, which some voucher uh, supporters believed would happen and tended to show on the, um, uh, on the outcome measures uh, that they weren't doing well. And as the journalist said, education scholars were hoping the Milwaukee experiment would settle the question, fat chance. Um, and in the article, um, you know, Witte is quoted as, as uh, calling Peterson a snake and Peterson calling Mr. John Witte's uh, work lousy. Again, uh, you know, uh, just to put this in context, these guys now 
um, get, to get along pretty well. They've actually worked together on some research. Um, so, um, you know, one of the issues uh, to think about and th that I try to draw attention to and will continue, uh, uh, you know, in the rest of my time is, is, you know, there's a difference sometimes between how the research actually plays out outside of the limelight and what happens when it's in the public uh, sphere. I, I think that both matter. Um, the second is that was a was a, 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 a similar uh, conflict um, in 2005. This one uh, between Carolyn Hoxby and Jesse Rothstein, an economist um, then at Princeton, I think. Um, and uh, Hoxby had done a, an influential article in the Choice Debate. wasn't on didn't really have data on, on, on either charters or vouchers. Basically, what she was looking at was the notion that, um, that choice would lead to effectiveness by examining metropolitan areas in which there are a lot of school districts versus those in which there are few school districts. And the argument is if there's a lot of school districts, then families can choose schools through their residential choice, and so that, in principle, um, uh, that's a test of the market principle that competition would lead to higher performance. And she had done this study that found that indeed, um, you know, uh, um, competition, competitive metropolitan areas had higher test scores. Uh, Rothstein attempted to replicate that subsequently um, um, and uh, came up with different results. And, uh, Release those, and and they then, succeed, you know, followed course with sort of these personal attacks on, on one another, um, which you can read. So, um, I, the, the title there. So, so one observer referred to this as nerdy celebrity death match. Um, but I, you know, but but I think that there is a, a problem when you know scientific pluralism, which is a good thing in my judgment morphs into political attack and counterattack. Um, you know, I talked in my uh, research with um, younger scholars as well as established scholars, and there was no question that some of them uh, felt very tentative about doing work in the choice arena. They were worried that um, they would be torpedoed in terms of article submissions or tenure reviews by folks who on the other side, whichever the other side uh, was. So arguably, this could affect how uh, um, academic um, capacity gets distributed over, t over time. But you know, even more troubling is a prospect, I think, of what we give up as a society if the boundaries between research and ideological warfare become so blurred that politicians, foundations, media, and the public essentially conclude that there are no boundaries. And uh, as one person I interviewed said, um, sort of uh, trying to capture what he expected the average citizen would say, he said, oh my god, these researchers, these social scientists, you know, piddling and piddling, and one day it's this, and one day it's that, a pox on all your houses. <laughs> So if that sounds a bit bleak and despairing, you might be surprised that when Jay Matthews, who was an a, a education journalist at the Washington Post, blogged about spin cycle, he said, he called it a, an upbeat view. <laughs> I, I, I was thrown by this, because I, I didn't see it as an upbeat view. But I want to say something about why he might have seen it as an upbeat view to give another side of, uh, of the issue. And I'm going to do that, and I'm going to give just a little bit of the of the uh, data from the study that relates to the role of the media in all of this, follow, and, uh, and, um, and then, uh, as I said before, if there's time, take it into a slightly different um, uh, uh, framing. So, um, what's, what I think is important is, is, first of all, to make it clear that not all research takes on this highly polarized and politicized dynamic. Um, it's most likely when research gets defined in terms of competing absolutes. This happens in some culture wars issues. So issues like 
abortion. Um, in this case, it happens in terms of clashing ideologies. Very early after the first charter law was passed in 1991, the charter school issue came to be framed in many public arenas in terms of markets versus governments. This was a test of markets versus governments. And that, in turn, raised the partisan stakes and made the issue uh, as volatile and high stakes seeming for many actors uh, uh, because it was seen that way more was at stake than just the question of, oh, is this an interesting reform that maybe it will work? This, this went to core interests of, of conservatives versus liberals, of Democrats versus Republicans, along a range of issues beyond education, which is, you know, what is the uh, proper role and capacity of government? What is the proper role and capacity of, of markets? And in those high stakes battles, there's just not a lot of room for complexity, uh, nuance, and contingency. You know, well, it depends. As researchers, we often find it depends. You know, context matters, lots of things matters, funding matters. But, but in these kind of high profile debates, those, it, it, admissions, admissions of complexity, admissions of nuance, admissions of contingency tend to be seen as tantamount to capitulation uh, because the expectation is that any of those softenings of the, of the message will be exploited by the other guys. We wouldn't do it. You know, we're not the ones bringing the knife to the fight, um, but they're going to do it, and so we, can, we have to sort of monitor ourselves to make sure our message is is clear. Now, researchers don't necessarily have to get drawn into these battles, um, but to the extent they're trying to work with political actors to get their findings into public arenas, they often find themselves thinking in similar terms. And even if they you know, work hard and do keep a step removed, their allies in the political arena, or even their others, you know, not necessarily their allies, will often present their research in this kind of all or nothing uh, framing. So, I mean, that's, that's one kind of upbeat, which is it didn't have to be this way, uh, um, uh, it, and, and not all research does fit into these um, sharply defined competing absolutes terms. Uh, a second reason I think maybe there's a little bit of upbeat to the story is, is that even in this instance, I don't think it was inevitable that charter schools would be framed as markets versus government. Um, uh, I think charters could have been seen as progressive public sector reform efforts to introduce greater decentralization. I think that the original group of charter school proponents in Minnesota really fell into that cast. It was parents and activists and teachers who were concerned about over-bureaucratization and, and, and lack of, of of alternative schools offering different kinds of pedagogy and instructional focus. Um, so there's a combination of decentralization, parent community emphasis, uh, and professionalism, because teachers early on, uh, many of them were responsive to this. And as you likely know, and, and as both sides argue about what this means, at least early on, Albert Shanker, then president of the AFP, was uh, a proponent of charters as they were initially uh, described for the, that reason. Um, uh, so it didn't have to be that way. And, and perhaps most importantly, as a somewhat upbeat thing, is, is I argue in the book and, and, uh, is that outside the spotlight, I think research actually, by and large, did what it's supposed to do. Um, that, that the research got better over time uh, that as we got more studies uh, in different contexts, we got more insight into how context matters, that we were be able, which initially, initially everything was framed as charters versus traditional public schools. Over time, there was more sophistication in, in thinking about how charter laws varied, whether the charter uh, re, uh, administrations in some states were uh, serious in terms of their responsibilities, in terms of initial approval, whether they were willing to take the political heat and close uh, schools that weren't performing. Um, uh, and, um, and I don't want to overplay the convergence 
aspect um, because there's still a lot of disagreement about charter schools. Uh, I'm involved in a project, I'm not gonna talk about this now other than to say it and it might come up later, uh, with the Spencer Foundation where they're trying to fund some efforts to bring about what they call discipline dialogues in areas where there's a lot of controversy and they decided to start with charter schools and I've been working with them on that and, um, and it's still really hard to get uh, charter researchers to commit to a, 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 um, some areas in which they agree, but they do on a lot of these. And I'll just briefly say that, you know, so one of the big issues early on was class and race segregation. Critics feared, and I, and I have to say this was a, a major fear of mine. It hasn't totally been assuaged that charters would, um, would lead to greater stratification uh, and uh, less um, heterogeneity in schools. But, you know, it became pretty clear early on that the fears that charters were going to sort of, you know, sort of pick off the cream of the students, you know, go, go for the affluent students who wouldn't need uh, much resource support were not the case. Charters were not creamy uh, in that sense. Um, proponents said it would lead to natural integration. They said, well, the problem with it, we, the segregation we have by race and class is because we have segregated uh, um, uh, housing uh, structures. And, uh, and if you created a system in which families sorted into schools based on interests, that would lead to natural integration. Uh, well, that didn't happen either. And in a lot of instances, and overall, charters are internally are more <coughs> segregated, if anything, than the uh, schools uh, surrounding them. Um, another area was questions about markets and less educated parents. Um, and uh, you know, proponents uh, uh, critics, you know, were worried that low-income parents wouldn't be able to compete in, in markets. They wouldn't have the information to, uh, uh, or the time to do what's necessary to pick wisely. Uh, you know, and the evidence, you know, again, accumulated, and it's pretty clear that a lot of low-income parents have found charter schools. You know, they line up for them, and. Um, uh, so the notion that, that they're not, you know, competent consumers in that sense did not hold up. But by the same token, they don't exit very much. You know, part of the notion was that the threat of exit by parents from bad schools would be the leverage to get charters to, to perform. And, and even many charter proponents have come to see that in many instances, parents will fight to keep open charter schools that by objective uh, indicators appear to be pretty lousy ones, and in some instances, criminal ones. Um, but, you know, and, and finally on, on test scores, you know, I think, uh, you know, test scores didn't, uh, my reading at the, you know, at the time, and I still believe this is the case, is not only proponents, but even a lot of the critics expected the test scores in charter schools to be much higher. Um, the, the critics, because they said, well, Geez, if we didn't have to abide by regulations of various kinds, if we could have longer school days and longer school years, if we didn't have to deal with this stupid rule or that stupid rule, we'd do better too. Um, uh, but the research, you know, for the most part, again, there's lots of points of contention, uh, you know, has made it clear that overall, if across the two sectors, there's not a heck of a, if there's a difference, there's not a heck of a lot of difference, and there's way more variation within each sector um, than there is between them. Um, uh, now, to, to me, you know, that was reassurance that the research core was not corrupted. I think that's a reason to be upbeat. Um, but the manner in which it enters discourse and frames people's understanding of research, you know, became more and more the focus of my study as it went on. I, I, in the book, I look at primarily at funding as, a, as it plays a role in that and at the media. And I'm just gonna give some quick slides on the media uh, to move us along, because I'm trying to be attentive to the time. So, so just some quotes from, uh, uh, you know, how do researchers and how do some of the activists involved in these debates see it? Well, they, they blame the media, a lot of them. Okay. So, you know, uh, one researcher, you know, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is a quote, but this I heard from, 
you know, numerous people that, that they talk to reporters and reporters don't want to hear about nuance. They don't want to hear about contingencies. They don't want to hear about the need for more research. Um, they want to report um, that, that something's working or that it's not working. Um, they, you know, they want a story. And, and some, you know, because I talked to rep uh, reporters too, and you know, sometimes they were more sophisticated than this, but then they pointed the finger at their editors. Okay? That in order to get their stories on into the paper, they had to make sure that the story was, was clear, that the message was clear. And that meant saying that the latest study, whatever it was, was important, you know, and saying it was important meant having a clear message. Um, uh, so, you know, so the, you know, we, we heard a lot about, um, about um, uh, media and, and uh, uh, you know, including, you know, <coughs> researchers, prominent researchers told me they won't talk to the media uh, anymore uh, because of this. Um, and uh, a, a number of them also offering, uh, uh, you know, the, the argument that what journalists are doing when they call is they're, they're, they're looking for a quote on one side and a quote on the other. They, they've identified you as the person who's going to give that quote. And you know, the quicker you do it, the quicker you can get off the phone. And, 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 and the characterization that someone else uses is, and to me is, is, is this is like reporters you know, um, um, uh, uh, reporting on uh, the first astronauts going up into space or circling the Earth and saying, the, you know, saying something about the beautiful curve of the Earth. And in reporting that, the journalists feel they have to go to someone from the Flat Earth Society to, to give the other side. Um, now, to, to look at this, we um, uh, did an analysis of, of choice, of coverage of charters. And uh, um, I won't go into the details. We can do this if, if you want questions. But we uh, you know, looked at, at um, coverage across five major newspapers originally, over 4,300 articles. Um, in, in the end, I you know, found it most useful to, to zero in on the Wall Street Journal versus the New York Times. The New York Times at the time being castigated as anti-charter by uh, those who you know, responding to that coverage of the AFP. Wall Street Journal seen as, as pro-charter. And we coded articles um, that um, said something about research. Now, you know, it's important to mention that by far the bulk of articles about charter schools said nothing about research. I mean, they were, they were anecdotal reports. They might report, you know, test scores were up, or they reported, here are the long lines, and all these, look at, here are the happy parents, here are the sad parents, um, things like that. Uh, so there, you know, so, so the first and important story is um, uh, fully 87% of the articles on charter schools uh, did not deal with research at all. But we coded those that did, and it was real simple code. Um, you know, uh, basically, I, I asked the uh, graduate students who were working with me on this to simply say, you know, if you read this and you were a charter proponent, would you be happy or sad? You know, if you, you know, at at this article, and I, I we had them code the the headline separately from the bodies of the article, and the. The notion there was we thought, well, maybe there's a chance that the reporters are reporting a nuanced story, but it's the editors in their selection of, of headlines who are over, over, over simplifying. So this is just the result, just on this sort of uh, balance issue of, of, of our, uh, is the research favorable to charters uh, uh, or uh, less favorable? and. Uh, um, looking separately at the headlines and the content of the Wall Street Journal and uh, the New York Times. Well, you, so you, you know, if you look off at the most favorable, you know, uh, you know, well, Wall Street Journal was way more favorable. The content was more favorable than the headlines. That was the opposite of what we were anticipating based on our hypothesis. Um, uh, um, uh, the New York Times, uh, on the other hand, you know, is, you know, had more articles in the, in the less favorable category, although it's important to look at the, at the times, they had just as many pretty <coughs> much as in the, you know, as most favorable as least favorable. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, turns out that the, the story was in a way simpler than, than this though, because if you judge, this is just the Wall Street Journal. 
And here we separated out what kind of article we were looking at. And in particular, the red was the news articles, but the yellows were the editorial and op-ed. Uh, so what you can see is the, the pattern in the previous slide, the Wall Street Journal's pro-charter interpretation of the research was almost exclusively driven by the op-ed and editorial. But that's more like the, more supportive of what had been our hypothesis, our expectation about the headlines. Um, but that in, in, the, in the space, you know, more directly responsive to the ownership uh, uh, there, there, you know, and who got invited to write editorials and things like that. Uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, nuance uh, uh, got lost. Now, one thing we didn't find, uh, you know, was support for the flat earth hypothesis. So, you know, use of multiple researchers on different sides, studies or researchers, these researchers say this, these researchers say that, was very uncommon. Um, only about 11, 12% of the articles had that multiple polarized presentation of the research. Um, that was more true, I gotta say, than multiple moderate, okay? What was least likely was talking to a lot of re researchers who's, who said on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, but, it, but far more common was sequential coverage so a single researcher or a single study, a single voice uh, that was either presented as in a pro-charter way or an anti-charter way. Um, and, uh, and I think that is what contributes to this notion of, you know, and again, it's similar to what you get with dietary advice, you know. First there's the study that says salt's the worst thing for you, and then later there's a study that says salt's you know, the best thing for you and that, you know, and that's a, the pattern we, we see there. I don't think it's a systematic ideological bias in, for the most part. I think it may be a systematic bias about how uh, the media thinks about um, their role and their role in particular of emphasizing the, the current story, the current news and the latest study rather than sort of trying to put these things in context. Uh, more broadly. Um, now, um, oh, I do want to say something about this. So, so, um, and, and, and this can be one of our windows into how to think about this, you know, outside of charters also. I, I came to, and I don't want to overplay this, uh, as, you know, in terms of rigidity, but I did come to, to see over time a difference between how researchers uh, tend to approach, how you're being trained to approach certain issues, and how political actors tend to think about them. Um, that, in, you know, in terms of time and timing of when the research will, will come into play, if you let researchers devise their own studies, they're gonna devise five-year studies, you know, um, or more. Uh, you know, they wanna get it right. Um, political actors need it now. Um, I think there's a real difference in terms of multiple studies. Researchers, for the most part, want to look at accumulation of evidence uh, across you know, multiple designs, multiple contexts. Uh, political actors are going to ask, which is the right study? Uh, some of these, what I say about political actors, probably applies to journalists uh, as, as well. They differ in causality. I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that a lot of you are spending a whole lot of your time worrying about causal inference uh, and, um, and it's really a central issue in, in, in education policy research. But for political actors, a co establishing causality is more an issue of sequence, you know, what this happened and then this happened, um, plus a story. Sequence plus a credible story is, is often sufficient in, in political uh, arenas to uh, address this. Difference in abstraction, I mean, researchers rely on abstraction to find general patterns. You, you know, you don't talk, for the most part, about just this study in this place. You put it into a type, I mean, this, this intervention. So there may be, you know, I may be studying intervention X in school Y, but I want to say something about uh, similar interventions generally, because I am concerned about um, generalizability. So, so abstraction is the way researchers usually uh, move to find patterns, but political actors tend to see 
uh, abstraction that's artificial as denying the complexity of real life. This happens a lot in terms of in geographical terms, which um, in which um, you know researchers will tend to want to answer questions looking across multiple sites, for example, and political actors will often say, well, do you have data on my town? Okay. Um, uh, so, and, and finally, simplification, which as I say, researchers tend to do via abstraction, whereas political actors are more likely to do by, you know, get the gist. Uh, now, so what should we do about it? I mean, what should we do you know, as researchers or as policy actors or whatnot? I, I, I did lay out some of my arguments about that in the, in the article that some of you read and, and I do in the book, and I don't want to repeat those. I want to move on and, and at least get to this one other piece that I promised. But, um, but I, I, I'll, 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 I'll emphasize one now, which is if, if I had to choose out of the things that at least that I introduced, it would be getting away from the, what I call the myth of the killer study. The, the idea that if you just do the one best study, um, you're going to answer the question finally and we can move on. You know, whether that's the biggest study, um, the most states, uh, the most student data, the, you know, and many of these can be legitimate issues of, of genuine stronger research design. But my argument would be that, in, you know, that no matter what the study, no matter how good it is and how broad it is and how good the measures are and how strong the design is for inference, you're still going to be left with further research questions. Um, conditions change. As soon as once, you know, we think about external validity and generalization across places and contexts, but there's generally everything, everything is always changing. So once any study is done, then there's going to be folks who said, well, that was then. Um, so I, you know, my, 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 my uh, argument is for thinking about research as a collective enterprise, as cumulative. Um, and that means to me that we're better off funding a lot of studies in some instances than always trying to do one best. And a lot of studies using different research method, methodologies. Um, um, now, now I'm going to slightly switch gears just to to extend this sort of political perspective to address what I see as another puzzle in some of the contemporary debates, debates over teacher evaluation and use of data by, by teachers and debates over um, uh, um, uh, common core and common core in the context of testing. And I just want to do it by just introducing some distinctions and then I'll stop and open it up to question. I'm going to go through this quickly. So I think, I, you know, I'm gonna, I am I want to make a distinction between data, data systems, and data regimes, which may be useful. It's useful for me. It may be useful uh, for you. So I, I, it, I, I have to look. I, I'm watching this with wonder. This person, I don't usually do these dynamic <laughs> slides. I, I had no idea it was going to come out like that. OK, so, I, I, you know, I, it, it, I, in practice, uh, even relatively unadorned descriptive information is framed by interpretation. I don't think we actually get to see truly raw data. Um, uh, and, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that's because the, the decision, you know, just what we collect, what data we collect rests on judgments about organizations, about social pr priorities, um, and even elemental you know, data collection efforts um, uh, incorporate categorization schemes, typologies uh, that are grounded implicitly, if not explicitly, in uh, uh, theoretical schema. Even the census, which we tend to, you know, people think, oh, the census, well, that's data, you know, but um, uh, Ken Pruitt and others have written about the history of census and, you know, Pruitt, you know, uh, a, Count, you know, emphasizes that from its origin, the census has been permeated by political. This Ken Pruitt is a political scientist who then spent a couple of years heading up the Census Bureau. Um, and so he 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 came to these conclusions uh, with his feet right in the middle of them. But the census has been permeated by political considerations about who should count, how electoral power should be distributed, 
and what racial and ethnic distinctions are legitimate. So, so it, it's tough to talk about raw data, but I, I think nonetheless it's, it's, it's meaningful to, to think about basic data that are relatively untethered from particular um, political agendas, descriptive data that are collected in uncorrupted ways and are generally made available to um, uh, users of different types. Uh, and, and these you know, have a kind of flexibility that I think of by analogy as akin to um, uh, stem cells, you know, which is regardless of their origin, you know, they can be put to different uses. So uh, there are data out there that, um, that, um, that different, uh, given access, different kinds of interests, community groups, parents may use quite differently from say the, the central uh, uh, school district. Um, and so I think it's, you know, that there's, there's a, a way in which we can talk about just plain data. But we also have to recognize that most data that we're talking about, certainly in research, are part of also data systems. Uh, and, um, you know, that key indicators are not isolated from one another, but they're linked to systems that have particular <coughs> instrumental applications in, in mind, and most important. Uh, in the com contemporary setting is uh, that they're linked to various kinds of applications tied to accountability and assessment. Um, and accountability and assessment systems use data for tracking and evaluating students, teachers, schools, and districts for broader purposes besides research of, of allocating rewards and sanctions or targeting uh, remedies. Um, and, you know, my, my argument is this, accounts for what some people find puzzling, you know, which is why are teachers who should be, a, a, if anyone, the people who are informed and knowledgeable enough to appreciate data and the potential of data to help them, why is there so much resistance today? And I think one way to think about it is, is, is that much of the resistance to, to what appears to be resistance to data is driven by uh, uh, the systems in which the data present themselves. And our reactions uh, by stakeholders to those systems, not to data or the idea of data or the idea of data use. And I take that one step further by using the concept of regimes, political scientists, you know, use the term regimes to, to uh, uh, account for the, uh, the interplay among government, uh, non-governmental actors um, uh, who, um, who uh, align with one another, come to partner with one another over time, and the ideas and animating visions that they hold. And I think that there's some uh, uh, usage to apply as in talking to about data regimes. And in this sense, they, th that we're not just talking about a set of indicators and the systems in which they might be embedded, but also, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Okay. but also the, the animating ideas, so the reigning theories at the time about the relative influence, in this case, say, of teachers or non-school factors and how that may be uh, um, uh, a part of the um, uh, perceptual uh, soil in which a data systems are, are um, fed. The supporting interest groups, for example, the various political and policy entrepreneurs who promote data systems, the for-profit and non-profit organizations that collect, disseminate, and analyze the data. Um, so these, you know, supporting interest groups are um, uh, political actors to promote uh, those uh, systems in a competitive environment in which there are interest groups on the other, other side, I hasten to add. And the governance institutions uh, um, uh, in play at the time, you know, whether that's mayoral control of schools or, or a, within a federal system, a growing state role or a growing national role. Um, and the general point, and I'm going to end on this, is, is that I think that teachers, parents, and a lot of the other stakeholders who are uh, uh, reacting often in very strong ways uh, uh, in terms of, of, of both research and, and data uh, accountability systems uh, and what sometimes in what seems like a, a knee-jerk resistance to science and evidence are in point of fact reacting 
to a particular alignment between the dominant models of rigorous research and a set of ideas, interests, and institutions that are quite political in their origin and goals, and that maybe are, I would argue, you know, open to legitimate challenge through democratic politics. Uh, and if that's right, you know, if, if that's right, that a lot of the animus and a lot of the tension and a lot of the um, uh, alignments, you know, are are around these data regimes rather than research per, per se. I think the goal may be to make sure that rather than just sort of frustration with these hostile audiences, that we, you know, pay attention to a richer framing of research, that we, that's where we can play a role as researchers to frame more clearly what research can and can't do. Can't do. Um, uh, what it definitely shows as opposed to what it might suggest. And, um, and that in this sense, and, you know, researchers may play a role in a political battle. I'm, I'm not a fan of, of, of encouraging researchers to get involved in partisan battles over these issues. But around the issues that have to do with uh, the proper, the maintenance of, of good data, the maintenance of of, of data systems that are sensible and the understanding of the complexities of interpretation for data, there we do have an interest and could win, help to shape a coalition that would be more supportive of a more rational and deliberate discussion. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions of any kind. Quick comments and then a follow-up question. Um, so what stands out to me in this really interesting presentation is, one, the challenge of meaningful communication outside the, the academic setting, and two, um, that we're all trained in ways that mean that we're thinking differently from pretty much the rest of the world. So based on that, do you think that we have some kind of role, especially with all the communication modes that are available to us, to train ourselves to communicate in these non-academic ways, to write or blog or YouTube or Twitter, um, and maybe not get in the fray, that right. political fight fray, but um, you can kind of see what I think about the answer to this question, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but in ways that would model our habits of mind, our comfort with complexity for people who are interested but maybe don't have the same training we do. Right. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and you know, I tend to give elliptical and elusive answers, so let me do that. So, you know, I think it, I, I think it's really important to have a, 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 an array of people out there. I don't think there's a one right way, and I, you know, I, I'm glad when there are researchers who will engage in public arenas and try to clarify the debates. That doesn't mean that every researcher has to do that, or every research institution has to do that. Um, I, I, I would also say, though, that there is benefit to being able to speak clearly to non-experts that, that you know, extends beyond this political issue and whether you're getting engaged in, in, in that. So in that sense, I do think you know, that um, for, for um, you know, up-and-coming researchers, talking to some folks who don't get what you're saying and finding a way to get them to understand it that doesn't do injustice to the to the, um, uh, to the research it is worthwhile doing anyway. For those of you who may be considering academic careers, I also uh, just tend to you know, reflect on the real world and say, um, save that you know, sense of responsibility and urgency possibly until after you're tenured. I don't want, <laughs> want to overplay this, but it's, it, you know, but it, but, um, but certainly, it's, it's much more risky and problematic to do this early in your career than it is later in your career. So I don't, I don't know if that solves the question for you. I, I, I want to see researchers who will take ownership of, to some extent of, of the interpretations of their work. But I also want to see researchers who sort of say, hey, I'm putting my nose to the grindstone. I'm doing the best studies uh, there are, and I'm going to let some other people did you, 
just, sorry, um, acknowledge some of the institutional incentives against engaging with the public. I mean, what you just noted about saving it until after tenure. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, um, my experience in universities is uh, that it can come back to bite you. It can come back to bite you in the ways that I mentioned before, which is um, uh, if you're over-identified with one side or other on a controversial uh, policy debate, and people will tend to identify you based on your findings, particularly early in your career. You don't have time to do the study that finds this, and later you're gonna do the study that finds this. So they're gonna you know, tend to interpret it by the, er by the early things you publish, and they're gonna tend to try to put you camp. Not everyone, but many of them will. Um, that um, these things, it's not ideal. I'm a fan of peer review, for example, for journals, but I, you know, I also have seen enough peer reviews to know that sometimes peer reviewers respond based on their um, um, uh, um, uh, prejudices and biases. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I want you all to want to go into academia, so I'm <laughs> trying to, you know, sweeten this. But, but, you know, but there's a cost, there's a cost uh, potentially to do it. You have to do it, go into it with your, with your eyes open. I do think that changes over time. I know I, I do I do think that academia, particularly, um, you know, um, uh, more interdisciplinary units and um, uh, you know, value communication with the public. I, I'll say one more bad thing about academia, um, uh, and, 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 uh, and regret it, but. Um, which is, you know, people say, oh, people that that people get jealous that the more senior faculty get jealous of people who get too much publicity, who get too hot, or blog too much, you know. And I wish that I could say with confidence that wasn't true, but in some instances, I think it is. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Vivian Wong. Um, I very much enjoyed your talk. Um, so I, I teach methods classes. I teach council inference, and so I, I, I have <laughs> you know strong opinions about methodology. Um, I also used to be a community organizer, and I have to say that um, one of the things that I just really find you know in some ways inspirational is that you know I, I think that the really wonderful thing about being a researcher is that in some ways I feel like I have a very highly specialized skill to be trained you know, as a, as a technocrat, basically. And my job is to represent the data. Now, I agree that, you know, not all policy decisions should be based, based purely on, you know, what the data says or, you know, or should be purely in some ways even rational that our world is very complex and that people's values and their experiences and those kinds of things also matter too. But as a researcher, it doesn't necessarily bother me, I guess, that um, you know that my perspective isn't the final say in making uh, policy decisions because I think what makes a democracy very rich is that we have this influx of different opinions um, from people who represent you know all walks of life I guess and um, and so so I guess mostly it's just a comment that I think that um, that plurality in opinions is important and that as researchers we should be do the best that we can in representing the research opinion, but not have you know, ideas of grandeur in terms of what its role is in democracy, I guess. Yeah, well, I'm, so I'll, I'll pretend that was a question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, ba I basically agree with you. I mean, I, you know, and I, I, I do make an argument in the book um, you know, the, that's critical of the tendency of some, um, even university institutions, institutions to, um, to try to compete with think tanks and advocacy groups on their own terms, to, to, you know, be, to, to, to measure the value of, of research by whether it gets a lot of hits in the first week after something's released, for example, to put a lot of effort into crafting press releases and, and uh, releases designed to maximize impact and sometimes exaggerate the importance of individual 
studies and from a, again from an institutional standpoint and this is just you know this, I'll be, you know this is my political bias is is towards pluralism also which means uh, you know I'd like to see a range of different kinds of institutions there and I you know I well, shouldn't be surprised I've made my life in academia I value the fact that in academia after you get to um, you can you can do these things um, you know with, with with some degree of of of, of impunity um, and uh, and uh, um, and even realistic expectation that if you hew to the dictates of of good research is, and careful analysis and interpretation that that you'll be rewarded. Thank you for the, um, your talk, very interesting. I wanted to see if, it's a, a big question, so I don't expect a, a simple answer, but maybe some comments would be helpful. So I wanted to see if we could tie together your newer work around the rise of exceptionalism with this work, specifically in relation to data regimes, um, and your final point there about governance institutions. It, do you see a relationship between scientifically based evidence as a data regime and the trend towards general governance that you describe in the rise of exceptionalism. I'm going to wait five minutes while everyone goes out and reads the book. Um, <laughs> um, so just real briefly, it's, it's like you know, my PR firm, you know, <laughs> there they ask this question. Now, so it, the, the the argument in that book is, um, is that education broadly which has been historically buffered in school-specific institutions, particularly at the local level, school boards and, and the like, is more and more um, uh, 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 being affected by, absorbed into general purpose politics where you know, the obvious manifestation is mayoral control of schools where you have um, executives who are responsible for a range of functions at the city level also are responsible for schools and you know I and 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 I argue that's happening at all at all levels uh, 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 to some extent not that school boards are going to go away or or, or, uh, or the like but that that relatively there's there's a shift and that has a lot of implications and and, and I do think it has some implications for this so, I think a lot of the impetus towards um, uh, um, outcome orientation, performance management, data systems has been uh, facilitated by the fact that the, these general purpose institutions are more in, in, uh, involved in education. And that's because a lot of these things were um, uh, prevalent in other arenas of government for a long time. Education was kind of the last bastion. Um, uh, so it, it was, it's not at all, uh, you know, a, a strange idea, you know, to a city council member or a state legislator or a governor or a congressman to think about measures and data systems and, and things like that. So I do think it facilitated that. It also means, though, that, um, uh, you know, the other side of the story, which is in these broader arenas where there's more actors, where the, it, it's, there's more a history of partisan and ideological polarization where you don't have what, what in, in the US arguably we had at least around some of these issues of bipartisan uh, support in education, you know, that in those wider arena, arenas, the risk that research will be used in unpredictable ways in these bigger battles is probably higher as well. So, Let me echo the thanks for a very thoughtful and interesting talk. And, and I think the, the concept of data regimes is very, very important here. And, and I think if, you, if we go back to your example, the census, which is said begins as a kind of basic counting exercise in a conceptual model, but one that's linked to things like the creation of new congressional districts, which in turn starts a political battle over who will be counted, how they'll be counted, what sort of oversight. And it's a sense of process of shaping political norms that then drive what was a basic counting exercise, um, which has local and national implications and so forth to David's point. 
But can you kind of crosswalk that over to an educational example? Um, something like accountability measures that might be linked to changes in school management around certain kinds of metrics and so forth. How, how do you see the data regime story playing out in the way we think about the census at something like state level educational measures and so forth? Sure. Uh, forcing me to think on my feet though uh, because I, you know, I haven't played all of this out in my own mind, but let me read for it. So there's lots of things that we've measured for years at schools, right? Uh, you, you know, with you know, including, you know, at the basis level, counting same story, counting students, right? And you know, we've we we have lots of data on enrollment numbers. You know, now some of it may or may not be um, uh, totally reliable, but it's been there forever. We've got it at every grade level, um, and we've got it over many years. But when you start moving towards uh, money following students, um, you know, which is a broad part of these broader uh, 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 systems of not just accountability, but also um, allocation of goodies and benefits, then that takes on a whole lot more importance. And some of that can be to the good, which is uh, casualness in terms of when the counts are made and how they're made you know, becomes uh, less sustainable when there's high stakes involved, uh, but so do the incentives to fudge the numbers, to try to, you know, to the, you know at, at the school level to manipulate when kids come in and when kids leave and things like that. Um, I guess if you added in the fact that then there are um, increasingly private providers uh, uh, who are offering services that will help you with enrollment management or help you to deal with some of these issues. So they're selling their services around those things that would broaden it even more. Join me in thanking John.